For context, my mum has always been a little crazy. Never drowned me in the bathtub crazy, just a little off. Like sometimes she was living in a different world than the rest of us. Like when she looked at you, she knew in her heart that you were less real than her. I remember being really little and walking into her room to find her crying over a heap of her clothes on the ground. She had scissors in her hand and was cutting out every spot of purple she found. I can't see it anymore, Casey, she said through her sobs. I can't see the colors I'm supposed to see anymore. I went and hid in my room after that. When my dad came home and found me locked in my room, he asked me what was wrong. I explained what was happening with mom and he just sighed and went to talk to her. What I couldn't explain was that I hadn't locked the door because I was afraid of her. I had locked it because it felt like an added barrier between myself and the reality that my mother wasn't okay. When they divorced, I don't remember any particular incident that broke the camel's back. It felt more like an inevitable conclusion that we had all accepted for years by the time it happened. What I do remember is listening to my dad read off a list of the big crazy moments from their marriage. Some of them were a surprise to me, like him coming home to find her hiding in a closet with a knife. Most of them though, I remembered all too well. So, when the judge looked down at me and asked if what my father was saying was true, it was all I could do to nod back at her. Needless to say, my dad got custody of me. Even at 12 I knew that regardless of his case, there had still been a chance of things not going our way. Afterwards, we went to Sullivan's and ate our weight in ice cream sundae. I knew that it wasn't easy for him to raise me alone, but I also knew that he was doing his best. My father was a 46-year-old middleware technician when he chose to become a single parent. He worked long hours for too little pay, but still found time to tutor me in math and come to my track meets. He was patient. He was gentle. He's my hero. But all of that is just a leap up to my story, right? It turns out that a few months ago, my mom got in contact with my dad. She said that she was getting treatment, that she wanted to make reparations. She even gave him the number of her psychiatrist, who my dad promptly called. The man on the other end of the line assured my dad that his ex-wife wasn't the same person from four years prior. He said that she had changed, that she was getting better. He promised that getting closure with my dad and me was vital to her healing. At first, my dad refused. He was convinced that no amount of medication or therapy could change the woman who had haunted him and his daughter all those years. Eventually though, he met with her. He says that it was just to get her off his back, to put the nail in the coffin. Instead. He realized that she really was acting different, more lucid, more stable. They met a few more times, and with each meeting he became more and more convinced that she had gotten better. That this time would be different. When he walked into the house after seeing her, I couldn't tell what he was feeling. It felt like some kind of exhausted hope, the kind that shouldn't still have a pulse an undead yearning. He needed help, I'd known that for years. He was working himself to the bone trying to take care of both of us. When I'd been born, my dad had signed up to be a part of the team. Now it was just him and the growing shadows under his eyes. When he gently asked if I wanted to see my mom again, I nodded enthusiastically. Not for her or me for him. It is so, so good to see you, sweetheart. 
those were the first words she said to me when she sat down across from me in the McDonald's booth. I can't begin to apologize for everything I put you through. She looked better, I think. After all the years, my memories of the way she acted and the way it made me feel had blended together into a flat nightmare. The woman squeezing my hand wasn't so scary. It even felt appropriately motherly, though it made my skin itch. We met occasionally for months. We were alone once or twice when my dad had to step out for a work call. When we were, she would tell me about her group therapy, about all the friends she was making. She told me that it took her so long to realize that her biggest problem was self-isolating. It drove me crazy being alone, she said. But it's okay now, I'm not alone anymore. Eventually, my mom asked my dad if I could stay with her overnight. He was clearly uncomfortable with the idea and told her that he would have to think it over. All I could think about were the work retreats, the trips with friends, all the times that my dad had missed out on living his life to take care of me, for me. And I thought that maybe, just maybe, if we got to a place where my mom could take on even a little bit of my burden, that he could have his life back. So I told him that I wanted to. I begged him to let me stay with her. And eventually he agreed. I'll be here to pick you up at seven, he said as he pulled my suitcase out of the car. He'd picked me up from track and drove me straight to the cramped apartment building where my mom lived. On the dot, and if you need me before then, promise me that you'll call. I promised him, offering a pinky when he gave me a stern look. He locked his with mine and took a deep breath. Your mother is trying, he said. I can appreciate that, I can respect it even, but I will drive my car through her front door if it means protecting you, understand? I laughed at the image of his scuffed Nissan hatchback smashing through the brick and drywall. I squeezed his hand. The evening was fine to start with. Her two bedroom apartment was neat and tidy, if small. It had a smell, too, like the ghost of something rotten hiding in the walls. But she let me put whatever I wanted on the TV. She even brought popcorn and soda for us to eat on the couch while we watched the police procedural. When I heard the oven timer go off, I asked her what she was making as she stood up to go check on it. Your favorite, honey, she said. Tuna mac. I felt the heat drain from my face just a little. Tuna mac isn't my favorite. I don't think I'd ever eaten it before that night, but I told myself to shrug it off. It had been years, hadn't it? It was alright for her to have a few misplaced memories. That alone didn't mean that anything was wrong. My phone buzzed with a text from my dad. All good? He asked. You're such a warrior, I responded after giving his question a thumbs up. We ate at the table as the procedural show wrapped up. I felt like we should be talking, sharing, but here wasn't much to say really. The absence of conversation stretched between us like a tightrope we didn't dare step out onto. As I scraped the last bits of tuna mac from my bowl into the trash, my mum told me that she'd picked up a movie she thought I would like. I agreed to it and sat on the couch as she put the disc in. It was a strange movie. Scary not in the way that a horror movie is scary, but in the way that a nightmare is. Like everyone around you knows something that you don't. It followed a woman with amnesia, trying to understand what had happened to her. At a certain point, it got too weird for me. The strange dream logic of the movie was like a headache I couldn't shake. I pulled out my phone and started to scroll through social media, trying to do so in a way that my mom wouldn't notice. I shouldn't have worried. 
She was so enthralled by the movie that she was leaning expectantly forward, her eyes full of excitement and hunger. Just over halfway through, however, she suddenly grabbed my knee with an intensity that made me jump. I looked up at her to find that she was still looking just as intensely at the TV. Watch this, she said. This part is my favorite. I looked up at the screen to find the main characters holding each other in bed, the sexual tension escalating rapidly. I felt my cheeks flush. I know how it feels to see a sex scene with a parent in the room, but this was different. My dad always got a little uncomfortable, in a way that made my discomfort feel more normal. He would usually fumble for the remote as he tried to skip through. With him, it was something to laugh about, a running joke between us. My mother's fingers digging into my skin as she commanded me to watch these two women going down on each other. It felt wrong. She shouldn't be touching me. Shouldn't be encouraging me to watch. She shouldn't have that wild hunger in her eyes. I knew in my head that my mother had never been violent, had never tried to hurt me. But with her one hand on my knee, I couldn't help but imagine the other holding a knife behind her back. I felt like I was going to throw up, like my throat was quickly closing. I, uh, I, I don't want to watch this, I finally blurted out. I don't think the words were even all the way out of my mouth before the TV flashed to darkness. The remote was already in her hand, like she had been waiting for me to say something. Okay, honey, she said, smiling. I've got the spare room all made up for you, but before we call it a night, I need to go feed my friend's cats. Can you come with me? I wouldn't feel right leaving you all alone. She held her hand out and beckoned to me. The hunger was gone from her eyes, leaving just that model calmness she'd had for the last few months. How long will it take? I asked. I'm pretty tired. Just a few minutes, honey, I promise. She looked so sincere that not believing her would have been like spitting in the face of God. I would be a bad daughter. A terrible daughter if I didn't trust her. Of course, I see it now. I see that a person trying to earn back your trust wouldn't act like they had never done anything wrong. A person trying to be better would make allowances for the pain their actions had caused. For her to look at me with the eyes of a mother that had never hurt or scared me should have been the first sign that she was living in a reality different from mine. But I didn't, couldn't see that then, so I got in the car. My stomach started churning after 15 minutes on the road. I tapped my foot on the interior carpet, feeling the silent moments in the car stretching on and on. You said this wouldn't take long, I asked, eventually. How oh, silly, she responded. I meant that feeding the cats wouldn't take long. No, my friend lives a little bit outside of town, but we're almost there, don't worry. She turned up the radio after that, a pop station that kept fading in and out of static. I could feel my body trying to take quicker, faster breaths and try to wrestle my panic away. I tried sending my dad a quick checking in text as we turned off the highway. My phone buzzed a moment later to tell me the text could not be sent. By the time we pulled into the sneaking gravel driveway, we had been in the car for 45 minutes and the radio was a hornet's nest of static. To call the place a house was generous. It was a cabin nestled in some deep woods on the outskirts of town, the kind where you can tell from the outside that the owner declined electricity and running water for the sake of independence. Oh, sweetie, they are just going to love you, my mom said as she turned the car off and dropped the keys into the cup holder. Then she got out of the car and closed the door. The cats? 
I asked the still warm interior of the car. The inside of the cabin was no better than the outside. When I walked in, my mom was already holding a long-necked lighter to a lantern, casting a dim and gloomy light around the place. The rug on the hardwood floor was moth-eaten and ragged. The rotten coffee table looked like it was ready to fall over at any second. The old couch was grey and muted, and I didn't want to find out if it was from sun damage or dust. So, uh, your friend lives here? I asked slowly. I have to go get the food from the shed. She called cheerily back to me, not answering my question as she stepped out the screened back door. I looked around me. No bowls for cat food. No scratching posts, not even any claw damage on the old couch. In that moment, standing in the dim light of a strange place, an unwelcome thought popped into my head. The storybook image of Hansel and Gretel being led into the woods by the father that would soon abandon them. She's not going to leave me here, I told myself. That would be crazy. The memory of her cutting the purple from her clothes was my only rebuttal. I listened closely to the silence of the night, sure that I would hear the sound of feet on the gravel, the sound of the engine turning over. Instead, through the overwhelming silence, I heard a shuffle. The creak of a board, the sound of someone trying to stay still, trying not to be perceived. Did she double back? Is she going to try to scare me? Why would she do that? I jumped when the screen door slammed open, admitting my mother and the 25 pound bag of dry food she carried. Hungry cats, I muttered. Cats? she asked. I saw such a genuine confusion on her face that it made my eyes well up with tears. The cats? That we're here to feed? I said, my voice small. Oh, hungry cats, she laughed. Sorry, I misheard you. Yes, yes, very hungry cats. Hungrier than you think. I helped her move the bag to the porch, where she flashed the screen of her phone around until she found a grimy dog food bowl tucked beneath a rotten bench. There we are, she said. She haphazardly tore the bag open and spilled kibble into the dusty bowl. So we can go now? I asked. Oh no, sweetie, she said, turning to me with confusion on her face. We have to wait until the cats come to eat, don't you know anything? Oh, okay. My body began to shift and tighten in a way I'd consciously forgotten. The knowledge that the person in front of me was not living in the same reality as me shot through me like pain. The awareness that the wrong word could have my mother ripping my throat out with her teeth shook me. So, um, uh, what's your friend's name? What do you mean? Her eyes were no longer on me. They were in the tree line, tracing the shadows between the trunks. Um, your friend, the one who owns this house? Yeah, it's his house. He doesn't come by much anymore but he told me I was free to visit whenever I wanted. I just had to feed the cats when I did. She turned to look at me, but I knew she wasn't seeing her daughter. Her eyes drifted around me like she was evaluating a statue or a cut of meat. I looked away from her instinctively. I traced the same trees with my eyes, knowing that her unrelenting stare was on me all the while. Out of the other corner of my eye, however, I caught movement. I concentrated on it without looking and realized I must be seeing the shed where the food had been. The roof was caved in like the victim of a violent crime. The door was hanging off the hinges. And there, poking out from behind the rotten mass of the shed, was a figure a grey form against the shadowed backdrop of the woods. It loomed from the darkness with something like curiosity. 
You know, we might be here a while, waiting, my mum said, eyes still on me. Why don't you go lay down inside? I don't want you telling your father I kept you up all night. Yeah, I said. My voice sounded a thousand miles away. I felt like I was swimming through glass, slow and morbid. Why don't I go lay down in the car? That way when we leave, you won't have to wake me up. No. Her voice was stern now. Harsh. You'll hurt your back in the car, Casey. Lay down on the couch. But... You are my daughter. She shouted, her voice ringing in the night air. When I tell you to go to sleep, you will go to sleep, goddammit. Do you understand? I felt my breathing go ragged, felt the tears falling, but I was no longer in my body. I was made of clay, soft and moldable, easy to smash and put away when you're done with it. My mum's arms were around me in an instant. It's okay, honey, mummy's here. She spoke like she hadn't been the one to shout at me even as she led me into the abandoned cabin. Mummy's going to make it all better. You just need to lay down, all right? She laid me down on the dusty couch and patted my cheek with one hand. Then she walked through the door onto the porch, then into the grass. Here, kitty kitty, she began to coo. Here, kitty kitty. I needed to get up. I needed to run. I needed to get to the car, but my limbs felt heavy and weak. Like all it took was having my mother yell at me for that childhood fear to fall over me like chains. As I tried to slow my breathing to regain control of my body, I heard my mother's voice grow fainter and fainter. Was she walking away from the cabin? Was she walking into the woods? That's when I noticed the other sounds. Not the shuffling from before. Not the sounds of hiding. Sounds of walking. Of carefully measured steps. I heard the boards creak in an even rhythm, like something was slow dancing all wrong. I heard the dry rasp of nails on peeling wallpaper. I heard laughter that sounded wet and dry at the same time. Something began to move against the back of the couch, and I stared with half-closed eyes at its shadow on the wall. In the outline cast by the dim little lantern, I saw something clamber onto the back of the couch. It perched there like a gargoyle but I could see that it was massive, the size of a man, balancing precariously on a worn piece of furniture that groaned in protest. The thing above me emitted a low growl, like the rumble of a distant earthquake. I felt a heavy wetness hit my shoulder and begin to run down my limp arm. I stayed still, not by choice, not because I thought it would keep me alive. In that moment, I knew that I was dead, that I would never see my dad again. I knew that I was going to be eaten or murdered or torn apart by whatever this drooling thing was. And since I knew that to be true, I knew that there was no point in running, no point in fighting. It was over. All that was left was to accept that. There you are, you nasty thing. My mum's voice cut through the tension like a flashlight through darkness. Your friends are all out there. Don't worry, you can play with her later after she's had her nap. Through the slits of my eyelids, I watched as the shadow of the figure leapt heavily to the ground. It danced violently into view spinning in slow and even circles before it came to rest on all fours by my mother's feet. It looked mostly human, 
but the proportions were wrong. The arms were too long, the knees bent at impossible angles. As it followed my mum through the door, it looked back at me. Where the eyes should have been were spheres of black glass. The surrounding skin was mottled and scarred in horrible, twisting patterns. As it smiled, I saw that where the flat chiclets of teeth should have been were instead sharp splinters of bone that seemed to bleed freely. Long rivulets of bloody drool spilled out onto the hardwood. It cocked its head at me, the black glass looking into my soul. Then it leaned its head back, inhaled long and deep, and followed my mother through the door. Good kitty, I heard my mother say from the porch. Her voice was drowned out by the sound of dry food being shattered by sharp teeth. The back door, that was all I could think of. That rusted screen door was my only hope of escape. I slid myself off of the couch as quietly as possible, my knee landing softly on the tattered rug. I stayed low to the ground and crept around the couch, stepping only on boards that looked sturdy. She'll be so excited to meet you all, pretty girl. My mom was still cooing to the things on the porch. And I know you'll be so happy to see her too. I promised you more wet food, didn't I? Once I reached the screen door, I took a deep breath. This door had been loud when my mum had opened it earlier. Looking at the rusty spring holding the door closed, I could only hope that that had been the source. As I put my hand to the spring, a sound from the porch burrowed into my shaking bones. It was somewhere between a howl and a gasp, the sound of air running over broken windpipes, a song I didn't want to hear. It spoke to a deep, ancient part of my brain. It told me to hide. Shaking worse than ever now, I pulled at the spring just enough to pop it off the screw holding it into the door. Shaking worse than ever now, I pulled at the spring just enough to pop it off the screw holding it to the door. Then, my breath still, I pushed the door open and hoped for the best. It didn't make a sound, at least not over the yowling from the porch. It swung open in silent invitation to the darkness. All that panic. All that fear wouldn't let me be careful anymore. I could see the nose of the car in the carport, could practically taste the dust covering the tires. I couldn't wait. My feet were quiet as I ran through the grass, but the second I stepped onto the gravel of the carport, the porch singing stopped. Casey? My mum called. Honey, where are you? In moments of true panic, I've never experienced time moving any slower or faster, like people describe. For me, things just start happening all at once. In my mind, there is no delineation between the moment I pulled the door open, the moment I scrambled for the keys, or the moment I slammed the car into reverse. They all happened simultaneously, like photographs spinning in open air. As I changed gears to drive, however, I remember my mother standing in front of the car. The headlights played against the fabric of her dress. The dust kicked up by the car obscured her and the half dozen creatures flanking her on either side. And in her eyes, I saw real hurt a genuine sense of betrayal. What are you doing? I saw her mouth. I didn't answer. Instead, in flagrant violation of the three methods I had left before I could drive a car without a guardian present, 
I tore down the driveway and away from this madness. I took every curve inadvisably fast, feeling the inertia of the car trying to buck me every time. I drove so fast that the cloud of dust behind me quickly obscured the house from view. Good riddance. I was almost to the main road when I caught sight of the thing in the corner of my eye. It was one of the creatures, the one from inside the house, lopping easily alongside my reckless driving. Its glass eyes weren't looking ahead of it, however. They were locked on me. As it stared me down with its smile, I knew something beyond a shadow of a doubt. I had imagined that these creatures were human, maybe deformed or mutated, but still human. And even driven insane with pain, a human could be reasoned with, could empathize with you on some level. But these weren't human. They had never been human, not by a long shot. In that smile, gleaming with blood and the contortion of muscles where eyes should have been, I knew that these were something else, something other. This wasn't the shape of a human become alien, but of something alien trying to appear human. It had only gotten the details wrong after all. I exploded onto the paved road and took off in what direction I thought the highway had been, keeping an eye out for the creature. I saw it pacing along rooftops, tracking me through the flickering sodium vapor lights. By the time I hit the highway, the thing seemed to be gone, but I couldn't be sure. I think that was the point that I realized that tears were shattering on my thighs, that I was gasping air in through sobs. So I drove, not towards home, not towards anywhere in particular. I pushed the speed limit trying to put as much distance between me and that awful, awful cabin. It wasn't until I felt something buzzing at my feet that I thought about stopping. In the chaos, my phone must have fallen to the floor. I grabbed at it and saw that I had a dozen texts from my dad and twenty missed calls. My tears changed then, no longer those of an SKP. These were the tears of someone about to be rescued. I pulled into a rest stop and called him sniffling. I tried to explain, but before I could, he cut me off to ask where I was. I read him the address of the stop. Tell me everything, he said. I could hear him getting into his Nissan. So I did. I told him everything. I know that in stories like mine, the teenage daughter always holds back details so she isn't thrown into a mental hospital. But I didn't even think to do that. I told my dad about the movie, about the tuna mac, about mum saying that she just had to go feed some cats. When I told him about seeing the first creature behind the shed, I threw up in the passenger seat. My dad eventually got to me. I fell into his arms and sobbed and screamed and shook there. And my father, the middle-aged IT professional with a bad hip held me like I was five years old. We're going to call the police, he said, running his hand through my hair. We're going to tell them the important bits. She took you to a strange place and made you feel afraid, right? But how? I don't think we can explain those other parts, honey, but I don't think they make a difference either. I nodded. That made sense. We were halfway back home when the weight of the night settled over me. Waves of tiredness washing me away from consciousness. I looked at the clock and smiled. It was 7 a.m. On the dot, I said, starting to drift away. On the dot, kiddo, just like I said. That was a week ago. After we talked to the police, they sent a patrol car up to the cabin for my mom. When they got there, no one was around. All they found was an empty dog food bowl with my mother's shoes set neatly beside it. 
according to county records. The cabin had been abandoned for decades. The last owner had died before the turn of the century, and the land deed was split between his children. The police talked to all of them, but none of them had any connection to my mum. They assure us that they are still looking into it, but I'm not holding my breath. It doesn't matter anyway, because we're leaving. The house is already listed. My dad has been doing online interviews for a new job in a new city. He stayed home from work all week, and he called me out of school. We keep the doors locked and the windows drawn. The revolver he normally keeps in a safe is always nearby now. As soon as he can lock down a new job, he says, we're booking our flights. We're getting away from this town, from my mom and her monsters. In the meantime, we're sleeping in the family room. I sleep on the pool out, while Dad stays awake in the love seat, watching over me. I can't wait to leave though, because sometimes, as hard as he tries, my hero falls asleep. And sometimes, when he does, and I listen really close to the silence, I can hear that awful, awful singing, and every night, it's getting a little bit closer. Thank you for being here and watching the full video. I hope you enjoyed the story and the narration. If you did, be sure to spook the like button. And if you subscribe to the channel, please comment below. I answer all the comments personally.